Hey, it's Becca. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you guys are new. I got a new webcam for Christmas, and I'm so excited. And it's literally Christmas Day. It's I've done all this stuff, so it's totally fine. But I really wanted to sit down, test this camera out, and record something for you guys because, of course, why wouldn't I want to do that? I have so many ideas and so much free time on my hands. I might might as well film this tonight for you guys. <laughs> So, I really thought I would have learned from the last time I rewrote a show and how much work that was, um, but no, I have not learned. I have done it again. I have taken another kid's cartoon show and decided to rewrite it because that's just what I do. That's what I do. So, I'm going to be writing Miraculous Ladybug today how I would rewrite it. I've had this script done for a really long time, um, a couple months now, before I started working on this before I watched any of season five and most of season four. I started watching season four when I started writing this, but I hadn't really watched anything else. So bear that in mind with this. Um, but yeah, I thought this would be fun to go over today because season five is like in full swing. We're in it now. So I thought might as well be time to rewrite the show. So here we go. This is going to be a little bit different than the last rewrite I did because the show isn't over yet. It's still going, but I am still not exactly loving the path that they're taking to get to the end. I don't need to know how it ends to know that I don't really like how they're getting there. So I figured might as well just kind of start fresh in my own rewrite and just see where I end up because I had no clue where I wanted this to end when I started writing it and I just kept writing and I'm pretty satisfied with how it turned out. So yeah, I think my goal for this is just to create something super satisfying and to not leave too many loose threads, but I might because again, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know why I said again. I don't know what I'm doing with this sort of thing. This is just me having fun. So that does bring me to a disclaimer. I'm not saying I can write a show better than professional show writers. I know I can't. I am a college sophomore just having fun rewriting one show that I enjoy. This is all one basically giant fan fiction. That's how you can think of this. It's one giant fan fiction. So yeah, this is just me taking creative writing because I love creative writing and putting it online for you guys. I'm not saying I could do a better job than actual showrunners. I know that they have a ton of pressure from studio execs and higher ups and just other people. I know, I understand, trust me, I understand that they have so much pressure that they deal with that I don't have to deal with in this fun little rewrite that I'm posting on YouTube. I get it, trust me, I understand. <laughs> so please bear that in mind and yeah, just keep that in mind while you hear about this. Also, I have my iPad here because this is a really long script. I don't know why the screen went dark there. Um, so yeah, I have my iPad that I'm going to be reading from because I cannot remember this. <laughs> so firstly, I want to go over some of the problems that I had with the original show, just so that you guys know what I didn't like and what I'm hoping to try and avoid with this. So firstly, the original has very weird or just non-existent character development for a lot of its core characters. There are so many characters that have just very strange developments that don't make a lot of sense or they just don't have any development at all and it's just it's very confusing and weird and I don't like the path that they have taken with this at all. The show has been going on for so long now and it's just very strange that these characters up until season five, I wrote this a while ago, I felt so stagnant with everything, so I just, I don't love how stagnant everything has been. Like, there's just, nothing's really changed, and it's been five seasons. I would have expected after this point, something would have changed. Secondly, there is, I think, just a lot of filler in this show that doesn't really do anything. <laughs> I understand it's a kid's show, but I don't think that's an excuse to have so many just completely pointless episodes. There are a lot of kids shows out there that are able to do kind of like filler episodes that don't necessarily progress the main storyline, but they do work to either like strengthen character relationships or build new ones or 
further develop the world building of the world that the show is set in. It doesn't have to just exist to exist, you know? Third, there's a very weird magic system that is not well explained at all. There are so many instances that it feels like the heroes cannot solve like the problem with their current skill set and then all of a sudden Marinette figures out some new ability that she has and is able to like save the day. It just feels like all like every time that there's like some bigger issue it's just like, oh new power, new power, new power. And it's like where are these coming from? Why have we not really heard about these things before? All of a sudden they're only relevant in the episode where they need to use them. I don't think that that's very good and it just makes the magic system very confusing. Fourth, the show has just a complete disregard for one of their supposed main characters. I cannot continue to sit here and watch Adrian constantly get pushed to the side because he's supposed to be Ladybug's like partner and like the second main character of the show. And if that wasn't the original intention for him, the show should not have been marketed in a way that alluded to that, you know? It's called Miraculous Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. It's not Miraculous Tales of Ladybug. There is the Ant Cat Noir. Treat him like a main character. I understand they're kind of doing it more in season five, but we spent several seasons where he was just kind of treated as like a side character, which is very frustrating. Fifth, there has been really zero progression in defeating this main villain that they've had since the beginning of the show. Like either they come up with some weird like plot contrivance to allow Monarch to get away or he just gains some new ability that allows him to like become more powerful and kind of set the hero's progress back to zero. Like it just keeps happening and it's happened too many times to be like, okay. <laughs> Sixth, this is more of an issue with the show and how it's released. It's just released in such a weird order that makes the timeline so confusing and I just do not understand the timeline like at all it's just episodes are all over the place and like things are happening and there's like no explanation for them but then you wait like five episodes and all of a sudden there's an explanation for it it doesn't make sense I do not understand and I just I hate that this is a thing <laughs> all right next I want to go over the intentions that I have with this rear I think it's important for you guys to know what I'm trying to achieve here before I actually get into it so firstly I want each of the main characters to have a satisfying and complete arc with all of their like actions and motivations seeming to really fit within the character and to not just seem completely out of left field. Secondly, I want the relationships to have a purpose and to be well set up and to not just be some lazy slow burn with like zero progression until something very sudden changes. Third, I want the villain's actions to have a purpose from the beginning and to stay consistent until the end and to serve as a real threat to the heroes in the world they inhabit. And finally, I want there to be lasting consequences for all of the characters, both heroes and villains, and I don't want redemption arcs to just be like handed out, you know? I don't want it to seem unearned. Finally, I want to go over what I want the general feel of the show to be just so you guys can get an idea of that as well. Firstly, I do want to keep the show mostly episodic like it is right now. So if you don't know, an episodic show is kind of like a villain of the week show, which is basically what Miraculous is. It's just something new every week and it's kind of a show that you can kind of jump in at any point and usually things will make sense even if you've missed a few episodes in between the last one that you've watched. However, I do want to bring in a few more serialized elements to really make it feel like a cohesive show. I do kind of want it to be to the point where you probably can't really skip episodes, unfortunately, but um, a serialized show would be one that has kind of just ongoing threads and storylines throughout the entire show, and it's definitely hard to miss episodes. So I want to have like a combination. I think having it be more episodic in the beginning and more serialized towards the end is kind of the goal I have in mind. For reference, think of Avatar The Last Airbender, how it was mostly episodic but still had a lot of serialized elements that kind of kept the show on like a consistent path. That's what I'm thinking. Secondly, I want the stakes at the show to kind of progressively get like higher and higher and higher and for the mood to kind of like reflect that. Like I want it to kind of start out like super light, you know, just kind of fun, just kind of get introduced to all the characters and stuff. And then as the stakes get higher, the show's going to get probably 
a little bit more serious, a little bit darker. I don't want it to get like, super dark. That's not what I want. I still want it to kind of keep the same feel as the original show, but I think having it get a little bit more serious towards the end is like the way that we should go with this. Finally, I want to put the emphasis back on the main characters because there was a long stretch where there was a lot of focus on the side characters and not much on the main characters. I think it's good to kind of put the spotlight on some of the side characters every once in a while, but I think they were doing it like way too much and I wasn't a huge fan of that. So I want to bring the attention back to the main characters of the show. And I do want to kind of put in some like big changes that I couldn't really seem to fit into like the storyline itself, but that are important to know before we get into the rewrite. So firstly, Monarch is going to be Monarch from the beginning. I like the name so much better than Hawk Moth. I think it's just, I just like it better. So we're going to stick with Monarch. And I think it just also makes a lot more sense for the Butterfly Miraculous, <laughs> to be honest. Secondly, we are taking away the creepy stalkerish tendencies from Marinette. She's just going to be a regular girl with a crush that makes her a little bit awkward around Adrian. I do not want her to be a creepy stalker because I don't like that. <laughs> I am also going to be aging the characters up. I'm going to make them like 17, maybe a couple more, 18, you know, like this will be like, say like their senior year of like high school. I know, I don't know how high school and stuff works in France, but like, it's like your last year of high school. Okay. That's what I'm, that's what I want this to be. I want to age them up a little bit. And finally, there are only going to be seven miraculous. I am going to go with the ladybug, black cat, butterfly, peacock, turtle, fox, and bee. I only want those. I don't want the rest of them because I hate that the entire class had Miraculouses at one point. I couldn't stand it. It frustrated me so much. So we're sick of a seven. I only want seven. All right. So another thing I did for this rewrite that I did with my Voltron one, so I'm going to do it here. I redesigned the characters. I aged them up. So I wanted to kind of do a little bit of a redesign for them. So I'm going to move to the side so you guys can see. You can put them right here. So first we have Adrian. He is the son of a fashion designer and I always felt like his outfits did not reflect that in the slightest. So I wanted to give him a little bit more of like a kind of chic look. It's not much, um, but it is like a little bit more kind of fashion forwardy. I guess. I just think it looks a little bit nicer, you know? It just kind of elevates his current look. One important thing I want to note is the little, like, stripe details on his jacket. I did those in the purple, green, and yellow of the stripes on his shirt. Um, another thing I did with these designs is I wanted to make sure I kept color palettes mostly similar for their original designs. I didn't want to change those too much. It was more just kind of changing the clothes. So with Marinette, I'm not the biggest fan of her outfit that she wears in the show. Um, I wanted to kind of simplify it a little bit, despite being a fashion designer herself. She never really does much for her own clothes. I wanted her to do something like she focuses more on other designs than herself. She's also at running everywhere because she's always late. So I gave her sneakers because I think that's important. Um, she's also madly clumsy. So I just put a whole bunch of band-aids on her because I think that'd be fun. Um, I kept the little kind of flower design rather than having it be on like on her jacket and stuff. I put it like on her jeans, like she embroidered them or something. It's also on her little purse. And yeah, I went with that for... Oh, yeah, I really wanted to just kind of, I don't know why I was really thinking specifically with her outfit. I just, at the time I was drawing it, I was in love with the turtleneck and crewneck combination. So I'm like, perfect. And my roommate wears a lot of plaid pants. So I saw her wearing plaid pants. and I'm like, oh, perfect. So I gave her the boots. That's the outfit. And then for the hair, I really wanted to emphasize her curly hair. We don't really see it in the show. And I wanted to highlight that. So that's what I did for Alia. For Nino, I wanted to kind of keep his kind of like simple, comfortable outfits going, just kind of change it up a little bit. We went for backwards hat instead of a uh, front-facing hat. Is that because I hate drawing baseball hats from front view? Absolutely. I just didn't want to draw it, so I went for the backwards hat. <laughs> I, I do think it works, though. I do think it works. And then we just kind of went for like a cargo pants and crew neck option and then sneakers. Chloe, I had it in my head that I wanted one of those little sweaters with like the tie in front. Just went with that. I didn't have much thought there. Kept the high ponytail, got rid of the sunglasses, never a fan of the sunglasses, but just kind of 
elevated her current design into something a little bit more modern. Lila was the one I struggled with the most. I just had no idea how to incorporate her outfit and make it a different design. I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know if I really like this one, but here it is. I tried to keep somewhat of a similar color palette, like the shirt is the same color as like her little romper and her pants are the same color as like her leggings. I kept the boots. I just kind of got rid of the jacket and changed the pattern on the shirt. So it's not the same as the romper. Luca was someone I just, I liked Luca's original design. I just changed a little bit, did the jacket over the hoodie kind of combination, you know, and boots. And then I, you can't see it here, but I imagine that he's got kind of an undercut type situation going on. That's what I picture in my head with this, okay? You can't really see it here, but it's there. And then for Kagami, I don't love the kind of schoolgirl uniform, so I got rid of that, and I just kind of kept the blazer. I thought that'd be cute to keep, and then just went for like a simple like black shirt and pants and sneakers. I think that they just kind of keep it simple and classy was what I was thinking with Kagami, and that's what I tried to do here. So these were all the designs I did. They don't mean much. If you don't want to picture these people, just picture the characters in the show. And I know that these are probably not something that would be easy to animate. This is just me having fun drawing these characters. So yeah, here are the redesigns. All right, I think I've been talking for far too long now without actually talking about the rewrite itself. So let's get into that. Many, many minutes later. I just had to go do a secret Santa thing. <laughs> so I did this secret last like half an hour. Um, because I didn't know it was happening. We thought it wasn't happening today, but it turns out it still was happening. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Season one. So the first two episodes are going to be the Origins episodes. So we're going to open on Marinette being late for school because, you know, we got to set the mood right, you know? And this is just, I, I liked the Origins episode, so I want to keep this like similar to how they did it, but that's what we're going to go for. So, Marinette's gonna leave, and she's gonna run across the street to the school, greeting Alia, who's waiting for her at the top of the stairs. I want there to be, like, a real, like, built-up friendship already between Marinette and Alia. We're not gonna have them, like, meet on the first day of school. So, the two of them are gonna go inside, but we're gonna stay outside, and we're gonna watch as this blonde boy, Adrian, runs to the school, and he is going to be greeted by Chloe, who is waiting for him at the top of the steps. And then they're gonna also make their way inside. And she tells him that her father has taken care of his enrollment, so not to worry. Man and Alia are going to take their typical seats just as Adrian and Chloe walk in. Miss Bustier is going to introduce Adrian, and there's going to be, like, a lot of muttering from the class. And Man and Alia are going to be like, oh my gosh, is that? And like, yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? And he's with Chloe? Apparently. Ugh. Great. Just random conversation. That's what I want to happen. So, Miss Bustier places Adrian next to Nino, of course, and the two are going to hit it off pretty well. At the end of the day, Marinette, Alia, and Nino are standing in front of the school, and they're talking, and the girls are like, hey, what's, how was it like sitting with Adrian at Grest? Like, how's that, like, what's that all about? And, like, Nino then tell him, I mean, he seems pretty cool, even if he is friends with Chloe, so that's the kind of situation. It's like, they like him, but he's still friends with Chloe, so it's, like, a weird kind of, like, eh, I don't know how to feel about him, but he seems pretty cool. So, they are going to get startled by a woman who is just standing in front of a very sleek car calling Adrian's name. And you can see his shoulders just, like, immediately fall as soon as he, like, sees her. This is Natalie, obviously. <laughs> um, and... After he leaves, Marinette's going to be like, what the heck was that? Like, they're all very confused about what is going on here. So she ends up saying goodbye to Alia and Nino and heads across the street to her parents' bakery. And on her way over, she's going to spot an old man trying to cross the street. Um, and um, this is going to basically be the same scene <laughs> as the first time she meets Master Fu, but... We're not going to have her drop croissants, or not croissants, macarons here. We're not going to do that. I just didn't really want to do that, but it's essentially the same thing. So um, she helps him across the street, and he thanks her, commenting on how kind of a young woman she is. And she just tells him, hey, please be more careful next time, and then goes inside the bakery. 
So we're going to go back to Adrian here, and he is being scolded by Natalie for sneaking off to go to school. And she tells him that his father was very worried about him. Adrian mutters that his father probably would like didn't even notice that he was gone until Natalie told him. And Natalie just doesn't have anything to say to that because it's true. But she doesn't want to like say that it's true, but it, it is. So once they get back to the house, Natalie tells him that his father wants to see him. And the entire time he's walking to his dad's office, he's just like, his shoulders are slumped and he's just looking very like dejected. He is not wanting to have this conversation at all. So his father tells him that he's very disappointed in him and that he never expected such juvenile behavior from his son. He continues to tell him that he hopes that one day, that this one day was worth it because he's never going to go back to public school. And then Adrian just like doesn't argue. He's like, I can't, I can't argue with my dad. I just cannot do it. And he just leaves and goes back to his room. The next day he decides that, you know what? I'm not going to listen to my dad. I'm sneaking out again. So he does. And he is able to sneak out before anyone even notices that he's gone. He gets to school and notices that Alia and Nino are standing in front of the school. And he greets them and Nino introduces him to Alia before telling him that they're just waiting for Marinette. But he's welcome to stand there and wait with them. So Alia's then going to joke like, of course the girl who literally lives across the street from the school is the one that's always late. And as if on cue, the bell rings inside and we see Marinette sprinting out the door and across the street. And Alia just, like, bursts out laughing. Um, Alia's like, that would be Marinette. And Adrian also kind of laughs. She tells the two boys to go in so they won't be late. And she's going to wait for Marinette outside. So once they finally make it, Chloe has to make a comment about the fact that Marinette hasn't even made it to the second day of school. And she's already late. And Adrian's going to kind of look at Chloe here like, um, what are you, what are you doing? And Chloe's just going to be like, mm. Like, it's just normal behavior. But Adrian's like, um, what, what are you, what are you doing? What is, what is going on? So now that he's had kind of like a couple of days to try and figure out how everything kind of works, you know, he's not going to be completely like socially inept. He's going to start to pick up on how Chloe treats like the rest of the class, but most specifically Marinette. And he's starting to kind of figure out, hey, maybe I don't know my best friend as well as I thought I did. At the end of the day, Adrian is going to be the first one out the door, hoping to make it far enough that he can get home before Natalie catches him and is able to pick him up. He gets outside, like, quickly says goodbye to everyone and just, like, runs. Um, and as he is trying to get back to his house, he ends up seeing an old man on the ground struggling to get up. Same, same kind of scene as before. We just, it's at a different time of the day, basically. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I, I liked Origins, to be honest. I thought it was good. It was just very weird that it was at the end of the season. So we're putting it at the beginning here. So Adrian helps the old man up and we can see that it's the same man that Marinette helped across the street. And he, the old man thanks him, commenting that he's a nice young man before Natalie pulls up on the side of the street and just like opens the door. She doesn't even get out. Adrian gets in the car without argument and as the car drives away, we can see the old man like just able to like walk away seemingly without a struggle. Again, stealing this from Origins because it was, it was good. I liked it. So in the car, Natalie starts to chastise Adrian again, but this time Adrian's like, no, 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 no. He tells her that it is so suffocating being in his house since his mother died, disappeared, and that going to school is just the only way that he can seemingly escape that like suffocating feeling. He begs her to talk to his father and try to convince him to let him go to school. And he ends up bringing up the fact that like, hey, Chloe's there. And she'll be able to keep an eye on me and make sure that I'm not doing anything wrong. And Natalie considers this before just saying, hey, I'll see what I can do. So the next morning, there has been no word from his father. So Adrian's like, all right, guess I have to sneak out again. And just as he's about to do that, Natalie comes into his room and says that it's going to be a lot easier if he can get a ride to school instead of walking every morning. Adrian's face just lights up asking if his father is, like, actually letting him go to school, and Natalie, like, confirms it. She tells him that he's spoken to Chloe's father, and she'll keep an eye on him and make sure that he is on his best behavior, otherwise he will be pulled out of school. Adrian then goes over and hugs Natalie, which seems to startle her, and he's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so at lunch that day, Adrian chooses to sit with Marinette, Alia, and Nino instead of Chloe, and eventually the conversation does turn to how Adrian and Chloe are friends. And Adrian's like, she's really the only friend I've ever had. 
He then asks them, like, hey, what's Chloe like while she's at school? And Marinette's like, eh, she's not the nicest person. And Alia's like, um, no, you are sugarcoating it. And Alia tells him that Chloe's basically been, like, bullying Marinette since the first day of freshman year. This whole conversation just leaves Adrian, like, really conflicted because the Chloe he knows is so different than the Chloe that everyone else is telling him about. And it's just, he is so confused. <laughs> So at the end of the day, Marinette's gonna like say goodbye to everyone and go back to the bakery. And she says hi to her parents, commenting on how much homework she has to do before going up to her room. She sits down at her desk and starts pulling out her homework, getting ready to do stuff when she notices a small black and red box sitting on the corner of her desk. And same thing is gonna happen where she meets Tiki for the first time and I want Adrian to like get home and have him meeting Plague for the first time be the same. I really think that this was a good characterization for both of them. I really liked it. So again, I'm just stealing from Origins. <laughs> so they're also gonna transform for the first time, just kind of like curious, you know, wanting to test it out. And this is where we can also get Ladybug and Cat Noir meeting for the first time. Um, and the episode is gonna end with... Uh, the two of them like standing in the street when they hear this loud roar in the distance and a large stone monster starts coming towards them. So the next episode's gonna open like literally on the same spot that we just like ended and Ladybug's just frozen like what is going on? What is happening? I am so scared right now and Kanawar has to like drag her away before she gets like smashed by um, Stoneheart's fist. So the two of them are obviously very confused about what the heck is going on because they didn't get too much of like an introduction to everything from their Kwamis. They were just like ready to like jump in. We're like, all right, let's go. Let's do this. And they do come to the conclusion though that like, hey, we were given these things for a reason. We should probably try and stop this thing, right? So that's what they go and do. And I don't really like to write out fight scenes, but just... It can play out the same as the last one. That's just the first time they fought Stoneheart. Can play out the same way here, other than, um, like, uh, Ladybug trying to give the Miraculous to Alia. That's not gonna happen. This time, though, Ladybug does know to purify the Akumas. Like, she can kind of just get this feeling that she needs to do something, and that's what it can be, or Tiki can tell her. I don't really care. She just knows to do it. So the fight can just go the way it goes, okay? simple as that. She is not gonna say de-evilize though. I know that's a English dub thing, but I don't like it. So she does not say de-evilize in this. She can just say purify. I hate the de-evilize thing. So the next few episodes can be them just like fighting like new villains and they're just not sure where these villains keep coming from because as soon as they purify the Akuma, like, the person just goes back to normal. So it's clear that they're, like, the people that they're fighting are not who are behind these attacks. There's clearly someone controlling them. I don't think it really matters exactly who we are, like, who these villains are, but I do want to include Stormy Weather because I think that, like, she was a really fun villain. I also want to include Eve Illustrator in here. Eve, Illust Eve Illustrator? Yeah. Uh, because I also think he was really fun and it'd be, int it'd be cool to start introducing all of the dynamics of the love square early on so we can get Maricat in there right now. <laughs> so after these first few episodes, Miss Boosty is going to announce that they have a new student in class and that her name is Lila Rossi. Lila's gonna seem like super nice and everyone seems to really like her, including Marinette at first. She ends up sitting at a table for lunch that Marinette and Adrian are sitting at and everyone's just there to like listen to her talk and like get to know her. Um, at one point, though, she does mention that she actually knows Ladybug and Cat Noir and that they saved her from an Akuma attack and that they've been friends ever since. We can see both Marinette and Adrian get a very confused look on their face and because, like, they're Ladybug and Cat Noir and they know that they have never met this girl before. This is the first day that they've met her and what is happening? They definitely have not saved her before. So the rest of the day goes on and Marinette this thing is really bugging her, and she can't help but wonder, if she lied about this, is she lying about other things? It just kind of puts everything else that has happened in, like, a new perspective for her, and she's just like, I don't know what to think. This is all very confusing to me. 
She is not going to say anything to anybody, though, because she has, like, no proof. The only proof that she has is, like, for one lie, and she obviously can't show that proof because she cannot tell anyone that that she's Ladybug, like, obviously. So that night, Ladybug is going to meet up with Cat Noir on patrol, and I think it's important that, like, in one of the few early episodes, we kind of get an idea of, like, what's ha- like how they're going to go about things. Like, they can have, like, a little conversation after, like, a battle or something where they're like, hey, let's not reveal our identities um, for, like, these reasons. It doesn't have to be long. It can just be something quick. But I think it's important to establish that so we know that they're not going to be revealing their identities to each other. And they're both going to mutually agree to these, like, rules. I want this to be something that they've come up with together. You know, I want it to feel genuine. And, like, they both really want to want to agree to this not just kind of rules that were like forced upon them so while they're on patrol they notice somebody else kind of like hopping like across roofs and decide to like go and check it out they don't think it's a villain but they want to make sure that it's not before they just kind of dismiss it so when they catch up with this person they see someone dressed in an orange costume resembling a fox with a foxtail necklace around their neck the person introduces herself as Volpina, owner of the Fox Miraculous. Cat Noir then asks if there are other Miraculous, and Ladybug confirms that her Kwame mentioned something about there being more than just the Ladybug and Black Cat. Volpina confirms this and says that she found a Miraculous just like in her room one day and didn't really think anything of it bef- like until she saw the two of them fighting Stoneheart. And she had never used it until now because it seemed like the two of them had it handled, but she got too curious and really wanted to check it out. She then tells him that she has the power of illusions. Ladybug is kind of skeptical about the whole thing, but her curiosity wins out in the end, and she agrees to let Volpina join their team, because the more help they've got, the better it is. So the three of them are going to work as a team for a while, and everything is going to seem to go really well, and they're becoming like a pretty effective trio when it comes to taking down villains. And Volpina's powers of illusion have become really helpful to them. So at school, Lila really hasn't done anything else that is going to raise red flags for Marinette and Adrian. So both of them start to think, okay, maybe we were just wrong. Maybe she just misinterpreted an interaction that she had with Ladybug and Cat Noir. It's not that big of a deal. I'm going to just kind of let it go. So at some point, kind of towards the end of the season, we're going to see Nino get akumatized. And this is really going to startle Adrian because this is the closest that he's ever been to one of the people that have been turned into villains. And then we can have the next episode being Alia getting akumatized. And it can be same kind of reaction for Marinette. She's like, oh, oh, this is close to us. Huh? This is, this is not good. So after Ladybug, Cat Noir, and Volpina save her, this is where Alia is going to decide to start the Lady Vlog. She's like so thankful for the trio of saving her and Nino and wants to start this as a way to thank them and like provide updates for anyone that might need them. And I do want to have it be clear though that she's not trying to figure out their identities. She just wants to be supportive of the heroes and like be like, hey, thank you so much for doing this for us. So after this whole thing with Alia happens, Marinette's going to be leaving the school and she's noticed that it's started to rain and she's just kind of standing at the entrance of the school like, great, I really don't want to do this. And then Adrian's going to notice her and walks up to her. He comments on how scary it was that both Nino and Alia have been akumatized recently and Marinette agrees. He then notices that she's kind of like staring out at the rain like, oh, I don't want to go out in this and offers her his umbrella. Yes, we're doing the umbrella scene. I think it's really cute. I just kind of wanted to put it a little bit later. I wanted to kind of see their friendship grow a little bit before we started to see the crush. And this is going to be the moment where Marinette starts to develop her crush on Adrian. However, it's not going to be instantly. We're not doing this. No, it's going to be slow. But this is the moment where it starts to be like, oh, maybe I have feelings for him. But it's not going to be immediate. We're not going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm in love with Adrian Agrest. Like, no, we are not doing that. No, 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 (laughs) no. And this is not going to be a crush that is so bad that she cannot function around Adrian. She's just going to kind of be a little bit awkward. We can have her mix up some words sometimes, but for the most part, she's at least able to be in the same room as him, next to him, you know, that kind of thing. So we're going to have a few more villains go by and Ladybug's going to start to notice that Volpina is beginning to like deviate more from their plans and her illusions are starting to do more harm than good. 
and it's it's becoming a reoccurring thing. This is happening more and more. And she ends up bringing it up to Cat Noir on patrol one night when Volpina isn't around. And as much as he wants to deny it, he can't help but agree that he's been noticing the same thing as well. He says that, yeah, this trio is not as effective as it used to be. And he's like, I think we need to do something about this. So the next episode is going to be them confronting Volpina. She is like originally like tries to deny it, like, um, no, what are you guys talking about? There's no way that I'm like this, you know, whatever, but she's a better liar than I can come up with. Um, but when it's clear that the two of them are not backing down, she unleashes an army of look-alike Volpinas with her illusion powers. They all take off in a different direction, and Ladybug quickly starts swinging her yo-yo around, trying to get as many illusions to disappear as possible. However, there seems to be one that kind of keeps looking back at them, and Ladybug is like, yes, this is, this is the one. So she signals Cat Noir, and they go after her. However, when they finally catch up to her, Ladybug throws her yo-yo to try to capture her, and it's another illusion. So she and Cat Noir are, like, trying to search the streets, like, hey, we still need to find her. She can't have gotten far. But at this point, it's probably too late, and it's most likely that she's transformed back into a civilian by now. And so they've given up looking, and Cat Noir asks Ladybug if she thinks that this means that Volpina might be behind the attacks somehow. Ladybug says that it's unlikely that she's the only one behind these attacks, because that's not her power. Her power is illusion, and they've seen that. But there is a good chance she might be working with whoever is behind the attacks. So both of them are very frustrated at this point. Um, because they should have seen this sooner, and Cat Noir is, like, expressing this idea to Ladybug. She agrees with him, but then reminds him that it was just the two of them in the beginning, and if they did it then, they can do it now. She tells him that no matter what, they are partners, and they're going to get through this together. It's gonna be, like, a really kind of, like, uplifting moment after such a frustrating, like, episode, and after Ladybug leaves, we can see this look on Cat Noir's face. It's very similar to the look on Marinette's face after Adrian gave her his umbrella. This can be the moment for them. I want there to be like a like a good moment, like a kind of more like, I guess, intimate. I guess I don't know. I liked the scene in the original show where it seems like Cat Noir like starts to fall for Ladybug, but I wanted it to be kind of a moment between the two of them, not just him watching her do something, you know? I wanted to I wanted there to be more of a parallel between um Adrian and Marinette and then Ladybug and Cat Noir. Okay? That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> so maybe we can do like one or two more episodes of like regular villains. Um, where Ladybug and Cat Noir are trying to learn how to work as a duo again because they had become very reliant on Volpina's illusions throughout most of their fights this season and they're kind of- it's taken them a minute to get back to how they were fighting before. So I also think it'd be a good idea if they did like a little interview for the Ladybug here where they're like, hey, Volpina is no longer a hero and we believe that she is working with whoever is behind these attacks. Do not trust her. All right, let's get to the finale. So we're going to open on Marinette and Adrian each like individually talking to Tiki and Plague, trying to figure out who is behind these attacks. And this can be a moment where we kind of get a bit of an explanation behind the miraculous. We can kind of learn a little bit more about them and set up what the actual magic system and the kind of like lore behind the miraculous can be. You can kind of leave it up to interpretation. I don't think it's super important. It's going to be, like, relatively similar, minus all of the fancy new stuff that they add at the end of the show. Like, they've been adding in the later seasons of the show. It's just going to kind of be similar to what it is in, like, the beginning. So, at school, Lila seems to be bringing up her friendship with Ladybug and Cat Noir, like, almost obsessively now. And Adrian starts to notice that Marinette's getting, like, tense whenever these conversations are happening and it's able to like pull her aside to talk to her about it. Marinette's gonna be like kind of awkward here, a little more awkward than we saw her in the beginning of the season, but she's still able to like hold an actual conversation with him. Um, Adrian asks her about like, hey, what's what's going on? You, something seems to be bothering you. And Marinette tells him that something feels like off about Lila with her friendship with Ladybug and Cat Noir and just the way she's talking about it just doesn't seem right. Like, something's not right there. Obviously, she can't tell him that she knows that Lila is lying, but she ends up telling him that she follows the ladybug really closely, and Alia seems so on top of reporting every single ladybug and cat noir sighting, and there just doesn't seem to be time for them to be hanging out with Lila, like, outside of that. And she's also like, 
they've got to keep their identity secret and they're not just going to tell a random person that's not involved in this their identities so this something's not adding up here she's trying to come up with something that would make sense because she doesn't know that adrian's cat noir and neither of them can tell each other that they know that she's lying so she's got to come up with a reason and this is her reason Adrian agrees with her that, like, something's not right about this, but is like, I don't think there's anything that we can do here, unfortunately. So during this episode, Lila is also kind of makes some, like, kind of backhanded digs at Chloe, and the majority of the class is just gonna be, like, kind of, like, laugh it off, but Marinette and Adrian can't help but just, like, look at each other, like, in confusion, and we can kind of see that there's, like, Chloe's face is a little bit, like, she can, it's something, it's kind of bothering her, like, Normally, she doesn't let anything bother her. She can just kind of brushes everything off. But, like, this kind of gets to her a little bit, and we can see it. And Marinette and Adrian are also like, hmm, that's weird. So, that night after patrol, Marinette's going to be, like, sitting up on her balcony talking to Tiki about everything. And it's very clear that she is stressed. The girl is going through it, and she is very, very stressed. And then, Kanoar is going to just show up, apparently having stayed out after their patrol, and she's, like, really confused because they've only, like, talked as Marinette and Cat Noir, like, once before during the whole Eve Illustrator thing. She's like, oh my gosh, Cat Noir, what are you doing here? And he's like, you just looked upset and I wanted to make sure that you were okay. And she reassures him that everything's fine and that she's just very, very stressed. Cat Noir ends up telling her that she's more than welcome to talk to him about it um, if she needs to. And surprisingly, Marinette takes him up on the offer telling him about her weird feelings about Lila. He then tells her that if it makes her feel better, he doesn't know a Lila, so he's definitely not friends with her, and there's also a good chance that Ladybug isn't either, but he can't be sure. Obviously, Marinette's Ladybug, so she knows that Ladybug doesn't know a Lila, but it's nice to know that it's not something that, like, a person that Cat Noir knows as well. And she tells him that that does help a lot, and that makes her feel a little bit better. He then asks if there's anyone else that she's able to talk to about this with, even though... Like, he knows that there is someone she can talk to. And she tells him that there's this guy at school, Adrian, who agrees with her and that she's talked to about this with. She tells him that it's been really nice to have someone to talk to like Adrian and that he's a really good guy and she's, like, really glad that they're friends. And this just makes Cat Noir, like, so happy on the inside. Obviously, he can't express it, but he's just like, this is so cool. I'm so glad that she's happy that we're friends. I love that so much. <laughs> Um, she then notices that he also seems to be kind of, like, distracted and out of it, and asks him about it, telling him that he can also talk to her if he needs to. He then confides in her that he's really worried about Vulpina and what she's planning. He also tells her that he kind of blames himself for her betraying the team because he feels like he should have seen it sooner. Marinette immediately is like, no, that's nothing you would ever have to worry about before being like, well, from what I've seen, you and Ladybug seemed really caught off guard by it. And neither of you seem prepared, so you shouldn't put the pressure and blame on yourself. So Cat Noir thanks her for this and ends up saying that it just seems like Ladybug's so good at this and I just want to make sure I'm worthy of being her partner. And Marinette tells him that Ladybug's lucky to have a partner like him. This seems to like do it for him and they both thank each other again. He then tells her that he should probably get going, doing a little bow before leaping off the roof. Tiki then comes out asking if she's feeling better and Marinette just nods with like a little small smile on her face. So the next day at school, Adrian's gonna like check in with Chloe, be like, hey, are you doing okay? And she's gonna be like, I'm fine, I'm fine. But it's it's very clear that Lila's words are like really starting to get to her. So that night on patrol, Ladybug and Cat Noir finally spot Vulpina. She isn't really hiding, so they're both convinced that, hey, this is this is definitely a trap. We know this is a trap, right? Um, but this is the first time they've seen her in so long, so they're like, all right, we, we have to go after her, right? So, they go after her. Once again, I'm not good at fight scenes, but just assume that they fight and there's a lot of illusions involved. In the end, Vulpina is gonna get away, but as she's leaving, she calls back to them saying that Monarch says hello. And just as they're about to leave, the two heroes hear a voice behind them calling their names, they turn around and see the same old man that they both helped in the first episode. And he says, it's probably time we had a talk. I'm going to read this directly how I have it in the script. Boom, bam, there you go. We have a season one. <laughs> so season one is definitely the season that I changed the least from the original show. 
Um, but the biggest thing that I wanted to do here was make sure that Volpina was more of a villain and I wanted to keep the mystery of who was behind the Akuma attacks a secret until the end of the season. I really wanted to vary up who was the main villain of the show because it has been Monarch for so long. I wanted to try and introduce Volpina and have her be like the main villain for at least a season to try and vary it up a little bit and I think having her be the main villain here is the best way to keep things a little varied and a little bit more interesting. Just hit the mic. <laughs> I wanted to put more emphasis on Volpina because I find her to be a really interesting villain as well as Lila. I wanted to put more emphasis on Lila as well because I think having both her as Volpina and her as Lila provide an interesting contrast and like provide a good antagonist for both the heroes as heroes and them as civilians and I really wanted to play on both sides of that. And Lila always seems like a character that just kind of shows up when it's convenient and I want her to just always be there. I want her to be like just kind of this like constant presence throughout the season or the show. In terms of Marinette and Adrian, I really wanted to try and build up their friendship before they start developing crushes on each other. It always felt a little bit too fast to me um, and like just very immediate in the show, especially once we see the scenes where they like we first see them be like, yeah, I like this person. So I wanted to kind of draw that out a little bit more. And I also think we are robbed of what would be a very interesting friendship between Marinette and Cat Noir, especially when they have their crushes on um, like the opposite halves of each other. I think having a friendship there is really interesting. And I wanted to build off of that a little bit more. Now, Chloe. Chloe is the character that I am going to change the most with this, um, but it's obviously not a ton right now, but I needed to start some things, so keep an eye out for that in the future seasons that I rewrite, but Chloe is definitely going to be someone that I am changing a lot from the original show because the way that she is written in the show is very, very frustrating to me, and I needed to fix that. <laughs> Um, there's just so many interesting ideas with her as a character and it irritates me that they do not play off of those ideas at all and just reduce her to be a one-dimensional character. So, I'm not, I'm not gonna write about it here. I'm not gonna write about it. That's not what this is. So let's just move on to season two. Alright, season two. We are gonna open on Ladybug and Cat Noir sitting inside of Master Fu's apartment. He explains that he chose them to be holders of their respective miraculous because he believed that they were the best candidates for the job, and he tells them that he is the guardian and is responsible for guarding the miraculous. Ladybug then asks him why he picked them and why now, and Master Fu tells them that uh, they both showed him a great deal of kindness when many would not have. He also tells them that he could feel some of the dormant miraculouses, ones that had been lost long ago, that had now become active and it was finally time to find new holders for the Ladybug and Black Cat Miraculous. Cat Noir then asks how he decided which one to give each of them. He then tells them that the Ladybug and Black Cat are the most powerful of all the Miraculous and that their powers of creation and destruction balance each other out and that they are the best fit for defending their world whenever it is necessary. I keep doing this. <laughs> he also explains that these two have always worked in a pair and have always been the most effective. He then goes on to explain that there are seven miraculous in total. They already know about the ladybug and black cat with the powers of creation and destruction. And they also know about the fox with the power of illusion. There is the bee with the power of subjection, the turtle with the power of protection, the butterfly has the power of transmission, and there is the peacock with the power of emotion. He tells them that long ago, the butterfly, peacock, and fox miraculous, along with the grimoire of information on all of the miraculouses, were lost and then never recovered. Ladybug then comes to the conclusion that whoever monarch is must have the butterfly miraculous, you know, logical conclusion based off of the name alone, and Master Fu, like, confirms this. Cat Noir then asks about why Monarch would be doing this and, like, what he, like, wants with them. Master Fu doesn't really give them a direct answer, only saying that it's very dangerous for one person who is not the Guardian to have possession of both the Ladybug and Black Cat Miraculous. So the two of them try and, like, press him for more information, but Master Fu is not giving it. Eventually, the two of them leave and they find themselves, like, on a random rooftop to talk. Cat Noir says that that whole thing was very weird and Ladybug agrees. 
She then asks him why Master Fu would be so cryptic and weird about certain things, and Katnohara's just like, dude, I have no idea. No matter the case, though, they both agree that things are only going to get more difficult from there, and they need to be prepared for when that happens. And they agree that they should start spending some of their patrols, like, training together to be ready for that to happen. So they end up both leaving from there, going their separate ways, and they're both still very frustrated from the Volpina fight and confused about all of this new information that has just been thrown at them. So we're going to have a few more episodes go by with some more villains and we get to see a few training scenes. And it's clear that this extra training is working well for them because they have been more effective at taking down vul- like villains than they ever have been before. However, Volpina still has not made an appearance since their last fight. So Marinette comes up with a plan to hopefully get more information on who Monarch might be and decides to talk to Alia and try and help her with the ladyblog a little bit to see if Alia's picked up on any information that Marinette might have missed. And little does she know that Adrian's also doing the same but with Nino because Nino is going to be a little bit more active in helping Alia run the blog. So back in their civilian lives... Adrian's fencing season has started up once again, and he has even less free time than he did before. There's going to be a new introduction to the team, a girl named Kagami, who can easily rival Adrian in skill. I wanted to introduce Kagami here. I think that would be really fun. Despite her cold demeanor, she and Adrian spend almost every practice together, and they start becoming friends. And at the same time this is happening, Marinette is spending more time with her friends and is soon introduced to Julika's twin brother, Luca. This time, she, like, immediately feels butterflies in her stomach when she sees Luca. She and Luca get really close really fast, and it's clear that being around him is just very comforting for Marinette. She has, like, been becoming consumed by trying to learn about Monarch, and it has bled so much into her civilian life that having someone that she can go to to just escape that is really something that she needs right now because it just seems like everywhere she goes that's just like haunting her and it's like following her so at school marin and adrian have also started to spend more time together as well trying to avoid lila at all costs because they're gonna avoid her that also means avoiding their friends so they're kind of just stuck together not in a bad way but it just, they've been sticking together because they just don't want to be around Lila anymore. Adrian has also decided to start inviting Chloe to sit with her, them at lunches and during study hall as well. This was really tough for Marinette at first because of how rocky the relationship between her and Chloe has been. But once she sees how much of an effect Lila's words are having on Chloe, she can't help but notice the similarities between the two of them and decides to give Chloe a second chance. And I think right now is a good point to start introducing the other Miraculous. We can do the same episode where Nino gets the Turtle Miraculous for the first time, but I want Cat Noir to be the one to decide, hey, I know who to go to, and to go and get the Turtle Miraculous and give it to Nino. Ladybug can, like, get the Teapot Miraculous and figure out- Miraculous, the Teapot Lucky Charm, and figure out that it means to go to Master Foos, and Cat Noir's gonna be like, hey, I have an idea, can you trust me? And she's going to be like, of course, because they're partners and they trust each other. That's how it works. So I think a good kind of like mid-season finale is going to be the final confrontation between the heroes and Volpina. Once again, I'm not going to write the fight scene, but just know that it would be very epic and very satisfying. (laughs) In the end, Ladybug and Cat Noir are able to take away the Fox Miraculous and reveal Volpina to be Lila. I mean, we all knew it, but, like, it's gonna be a big reveal. <laughs> so the two manage to hide their shock because they're not supposed to know who she is. That would give away their identities at least a little bit. Um, but Lila is able to get away before they can do anything. Um, but there is kind of a sense of, like, satisfaction. Like, they finally caught the villain and took back one of the missing miraculous. Like, yes, let's go. We did it. Let's go. So obviously this then reveals to Marinette that she was right about Lila all along, but it's so frustrating for both her and Adrian. They can't tell anyone about this. They can't do that because then that would reveal them to be Ladybug and Count Noir and they can't do that. But it's like so satisfying for them to know that they were right all along. (laughs) So this whole thing surrounding Volpina has obviously pissed Lila off a lot. 
So she decides to start taking her anger out on both Marinette and Chloe at school. Because of this, Chloe ends up finding herself drifting more towards Marinette, and she eventually ends up apologizing for her behavior over the last couple of years. She had no idea what it felt like to be on the receiving end of it all, and it hurts a lot, and she says that she's very sorry that she ever put Marinette through that. And this doesn't need to happen right away. I want this to be built up to, but maybe we can start seeing signs of it throughout, like, the beginning of the season that we're gonna, like, Chloe's gonna start apologizing to Marinette and trying to work to be a better person. The whole picking on, like, Marinette and uh, Chloe from Lila is gonna be throughout the rest of the season, so this apology can happen more towards the end. So now Marinette, Adrian, and Chloe are kind of like a trio at school, hanging out more often and just growing to be closer as friends. And due to them being friends now, Chloe can immediately tell that Marinette has a thing for Luca and like pushes her to go for it. Marinette is like kind of skeptical at first, asking if this is just a way for Chloe to get Adrian all to herself. And Chloe is just like, no, I got over Adrian a long time ago and Marinette deserves to be with someone that will make her happy. Not saying that Adrian wouldn't, but it's clear that he's not into her the same way that she is. So it's like, be with someone that's into you. She's also like, yeah, Luca is clearly into you. And Marinette's just kind of like, eh, I don't really know about that. And she's like struggling to accept it. But Chloe's like, no, he is into you. Go for it. And so in a brave moment, channeling her inner ladybug, Marinette is going to ask Luca out. And he's going to say yes, obviously. And the two of them get together. And don't worry, this will last longer than an episode. <laughs> and so now that they have the Fox Miraculous back, we can do an episode where Alia gets to use the Fox Miraculous for the first time. And Ladybug's going to be the one to be like, oh, I have an idea. I, can, I got this. So in an effort to try and like advance the fight against Monarch, Ladybug and Cat Noir have begun to go to Master Fu more often, just trying to get any sort of information out of him that they can. Because they don't really know anything. He's got all the information and they just, they need something. They were thinking that since he trusted them enough to let them choose who the Miraculous were going to, that maybe he was willing to open up a little bit more. However, there is no such luck and he is still as closed off as ever. And this is really becoming frustrating for the heroes. And as this is going on, it's starting to become very, very, very clear that Lila has divided the class with almost everyone else on her side and Marinette, Adrian, and Chloe on the other. This isn't going to be something that's obvious to the class. It's just obvious to, like, the audience and to Marinette, Chloe, and Adrian. So part of how this kind of, like, divide is going to work is that Lila is going to play into the fact that Marinette and Adrian are, like, always disappearing and never giving the others like, just straight answers about where they were, and this is obviously going to be most effective on Alia and Nino, their best friends. I don't want anything to be, like, super serious right here, but I do want to have, like, it be clear that there is some tension that's, like, kind of building in the friend group. Also, another thing that's kind of playing into this is that Alia and Nino do not understand why Marinette and Adrian are so keen on spending time with Chloe, and they're not really willing to listen to them try and explain that she is starting to grow to be a better person, and that's why. So another thing that I really want to stress here is that Marinette and Adrian have gotten a lot closer as friends. Things are not awkward between the two of them, and they're just able to, like, hang out together. And I kind of want to see a little bit of banter between the two of them like we get with Ladybug and Cat Noir. I think that'd be really fun. So part of this is going to be because Marinette was just not as awkward around Adrian to begin with. Still a little bit awkward, but not nearly to the point that the original show has it. But another part is also going to be she's not in love with anyone anymore. She's in love with Luca. And I think it's really important that we start to see a genuine friendship build between these two because <laughs> we're like five seasons into the show now and we still haven't really seen that that much. We've seen it. Okay. We have seen it in some of the most recent episodes, but it took so long to get there. So I think it just took way too long to get there. Anyways, to sum up the vibe, things are like a little bit tense, but overall it's kind of okay. So moving forward with the second half of the season, I want the villains to start getting more and more difficult. And the heroes are going to come to a point where they need to call in another Miraculous, but Ladybug is like not really sure if she can really trust Rena anymore because the tension between Marin and Alia is getting a little bit, to be a little bit too much for her. And Adrian's kind of coming to the same conclusion that the tension between him and Nino is kind of being like, mm, I don't really know if he's the best fit right now. So... This is where Chloe's going to get the Bee Miraculous, and I want this to feel earned. 
like she actually deserves to get this and not that she just kind of found it and just like was like allowed to continue being queen bee and she's gonna be a hero and i want her to really feel like a hero i want this new friendship between her and marina and adrian to really feel like a moment where she's earned the like ability to be a hero Alrighty, finale time so i've been kind of juggling with a few ideas of how this i want this to play out in my head but this is just kind of one possibility so monarch is going to akumatize like three villains and it's just too much for ladybug and kind of to handle on their own and they figure out that they need to get all of the other heroes that they've used in the past rena rouge carapace and queen b to help them and before like it's gonna be a tough decision because things are still tense between marin and alia and adrian and nino but they're like all right we have to put that aside we really need all the help we can get right now so before the fight starts marinette adrian and chloe can be like hanging out and they get the akuma alert and marinette and adrian are like clumsily able to like sneak away um and after they leave chloe alone we can just kind of see that she's got this like look on her face and she looks out the window and sees marinette and cat marinette she sees ladybug and cat noir like swinging by and she's just kind of got this look on her face like huh interesting <laughs> so all five of them are able to take on the villains but it took a lot out of them these were these were tough to beat um and of course things need to start going wrong so this is where we're gonna have the first direct confrontation between the heroes and monarch so he's gonna have like two and sidekicks i guess we can call them sidekicks just kind of unnamed villains there with him and rena carapace and queen b are going to fight these two sidekick villains while ladybug and cat noir take on monarch himself in theory this should not be a difficult fight but since the heroes just went through a really tough battle um they're just it's not going well um it seems like the heroes might not win but the other three are able to subdue the two villains using venom on one of them um and they help leave and cat noir momentarily take down monarch however Whatever they did to the other villain did not work for long, and that villain is able to get Monarch out of there before the heroes can do anything to him. The heroes, like, literally can't follow them because they used up all of their powers, everyone's powers are now gone, so they detransform before they'd ever be able to catch up to Monarch. So because Queen Bee was able to use Venom on one of the villains, they noticed that it's wearing some sort of, like, bracelet. They think it's probably an Akuma, so Ladybug breaks it, but instead of a butterfly flying out, it's a little feather. She's able to purify it, and the color does change from blue to white, but this leaves the heroes, like, really confused. Like, um, what the heck? As the episode is ending, we see Monarch getting back to his lair, and there's someone else there waiting for him, and it's a woman in a peacock-themed outfit. It's my hero. All right, there is season two. Yay! So some of the important things that I wanted to make sure that I introduced in this season were the new characters as well as the new superheroes. I think that season two is the perfect spot to introduce them because it gives season one really just to leave and Cat Noir. It gives them time to develop and work, like grow into their powers and stuff. And it gives us as the audience time to get to know them. So now we can start introducing more characters in allow us to get to know them as well. Introducing new superheroes in the season also shows that things are getting a little bit more difficult against Monarch and they really needed that extra help. So one of the biggest things that I ended up doing with season two was having it be a place for a lot of things that are going to set up future conflicts and plot points. I don't love that but I feel like it's important. I think all of these are entertaining enough that they won't really seem like too much setup. But season two is very much a setup season. I needed these like things to be there in the early seasons so that way they felt like they were like it was really like well paid off when they when we get to the conclusion of them. So I do think it was important that they are included here. Now, in terms of character dynamics, I really 
wanted there to be a lot of things that change within this season. So I'll start off simple, Marinette and Luca. I always felt as though their relationship was just really too short and I wanted to give them enough time to fully like develop and grow in their relationship. Um, and I just wanted to see how their relationship would kind of play out, you know? I think that'd be fun. So I thought that introducing it in season two rather than end of season three, end of season four, was a better place to put it. I also wanted to make it clear that while this is happening, Marina is not in love with Adrian. I know that as a teen, feelings can be confusing and you can be in love with more than one person at a time, but I really just wanted it to be clear that Marinette was committed to her relationship with Luca. It wasn't just kind of like a thing to kind of get her mind off of Adrian. No, she is all in. She is with Luca. She loves him. I want that to be clear. As for Adrian and Kagami, I really just wanted there to be a strong friendship with the two of them. I think that that was, that'd be better. I never really loved their relationship as much as I liked the Marinette and Luca one. Um, so I wanted to play more into them being like really good friends instead. I think that just would have worked out better. Another big change is the dynamics in the class. I've always felt as though we are we're robbed of a proper Marinette and Adrian friendship and that's something that I really wanted to make sure that I included in this rewrite and I just wanted to see them like interacting more and just hanging out more. I really wanted to see more of that. Another thing that we were being robbed of is a proper Chloe character arc and possible redemption. And I think that the best way to do that is with Lila coming in and taking over and kind of pushing Chloe to the side the same way that she's doing with Marinette. And I want the two of them to come closer as a result of this. I think the three of them with Adrian, like as a trio is like really interesting and I want that to kind of be something fun that we get to see. And by doing this, I want this to make sure that Chloe getting to be miraculous feels earned and not something that was completely circumstantial that just worked in her favor. Finally, when it comes to Lila, I thought that she would be better served as an antagonist to them as civilians and Monarch could be the antagonist for the superheroes. I liked having her as well, Pina, but I think it was time for that to come to an end and Alia needed to get the Fox Miraculous anyway, so... I also wanted this to happen because I wanted the heroes to be like be able to turn their attention to a monarch because I feel like if Volpino was still around, that was who they'd be focusing their attention on and monarch's the main villain, obviously. So we needed to get Volpina out of the way. I didn't want her to overstay her welcome, so that's how we did it. All right, let's get into season three. All right, season three. So this first episode is going to be kind of rather simple in terms of the villain it's just gonna be your kind of regular run-of-the-mill villain, only it's being boosted by the Peacock Miraculous. What's gonna be really important with this episode is that Alia's gonna tell Marinette about this really cool opportunity that she's getting with the Lady Blog. She's been invited to talk on the news about the Lady Blog, and she wants all of her friends to be there, and Marinette promises, like, yes, I will be there. So this next episode can be where that happens. Marinette's gonna be like, on her way to the news station, ready to meet her friends when she gets an Akuma alert on like the complete other side of Paris. And she obviously can't ignore that, so she has to go and like deal with that. However, this fight takes a lot longer than she wanted it to, and she ends up missing the taping of Alia's segment. As this like fight's going on, we can cut back and forth between the fight and Alia going through the interview, constantly looking back at the friends that did show up, and just like hoping that maybe Marinette was just running a little bit late and she will be there. Marinette doesn't end up showing up because she's fighting the Akuma, but it's not like she can tell Alia that she was doing that. So the fight ends and Marinette runs. She's trying to get there and she manages to just catch the group leaving the news station. She tries to apologize to Alia, but Alia is really upset with her, saying that this isn't like something that she always does, and she never tells them why. She's always disappearing and missing things, and it's just becoming too much for her, which is kind of a fair reaction, but it's... We know that Marinette can't do anything about it, which just really sucks for her. So as a result, Marinette's going to start pulling away from her friends. She can see how much she's been hurting them and doesn't want to do that anymore, so she just decides that it's better if she keeps her distance. You know, she can't hurt them if they're not close to her. 
She also is going to start pulling away from Luca because she can't stand the thought of him being hurt in the same way that she's hurting her other friends and would just rather just let him go before she can really mess things up. And Luca's like fighting this. He's like, no, we can fix this. And you can tell that this really isn't something that Marinette wants to do and it's hurting her too. But she's like, I have to do this. This is the right thing to do. I'm going to end up hurting him more if I don't. So at the same time, Adrian's been kind of going through the same thing with Nino, where Nino is really starting to get fed up with Adrian not telling him what's going on with him. And it's, but it's not as extreme as what Marinette's going through. However, he does notice that Marinette's been like pulling away from the group even more so than usual. And he really is just trying to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> She's not giving him anything, even when he like repeatedly asks but he is able to come to the conclusion that if nothing else, she is really hurting and someone needs to be there for her and he decides to like stay by her side. So obviously with Chloe, she's starting to suspect that there is something going on with her two friends that they can't tell anybody, but that's what's causing them to be like missing and late from things. And the whole incident in the finale is like the big moment of realization for her, but she doesn't say anything to either of them. And, but we as the audience can tell that she's, she's figured something out here. Lila, sensing some blood in the water, takes advantage of the whole situation, manipulating the class even more than usual into turning their backs on Marinette and Chloe. She doesn't end up doing it with Adrian because she's like sort of in love with him, but because of his insistence on staying with Marinette and Chloe, he also is sort of going through the same stuff. Again, just not quite as extreme as with the two girls. On top of all of this, Gabriel is just being, like, even worse of a father than usual. He is completely overscheduling Adrian, constantly, like, snapping at him and just being an overall, like, cruel person. Not sure how she's doing it, but Marinette somehow has been able to kind of keep it together. You know, she, it's hurting her, but she's not letting her emotions take over. And it's, I don't know how she's doing it, but she's... She's pulling it off somehow. Adrian, on the other hand, is not dealing with it well. And we're going to get Cap Blanc. We're going to do it. Obviously, this is not going to happen in the same way that Cap Blanc happens in the show. But just all of the stuff with his friends and him trying to help Marina and Chloe through what they're going through. And Gabriel just being a horrible father is just getting too be too much for him. So Cat Noir is going to be meeting Ladybug up like on patrol or something, but she's running a little bit late. And this is the first time in a while that we see that Adrian's kind of gotten some time to himself, you know, not in a house with other people. And we can see that this boy is stressed. And he just kind of starts ranting to himself about everything that seems to be going wrong. And he's getting emotional. And you all know what happens when someone gets emotional in Paris. He ends up getting akumatized and just kind of accepts it because he's too emotional to be thinking rationally right now. And as this is happening, Ladybug shows up. She tries to talk to him to try and get him to stop before anything else can happen, but it's clear that it's not going to work and you can just see her heart break at how much pain it seems like he's going through. You can, they're going to start to fight and you can see how much it hurts Ladybug to have to fight her partner and she clearly doesn't want to hurt him at all and this is gonna be such an internal struggle for her because this is her partner this is the person that she's been fighting with since day one and she doesn't want to hurt him but she also knows how much destruction he could cause if she lets this get out of hand he ends up being able to like get away for a minute but marinette's about to transform back so she can't chase him right away she ends up taking a moment to try and reevaluate the situation, and she tells Tiki about how hard this is. Tiki's in like, hey, maybe you need some help. And you can see Marinette's face kind of light up before falling. The two people that she easily could have gone to before, Rena and Carapace, don't, like, have officially become not trustworthy. And now there's really only one obvious choice, and in the end, it ends up being the right choice. It's obviously Chloe. So she's able to get to Master Foods, grabs the Be Miraculous, and gives it to Chloe. So once they get back to the fight, Cat Blanc will say something that just makes Chloe pause for a moment and mutter like, 
Adrian under her breath. She, we don't, Marinette doesn't hear this. <laughs> and this can be the moment that like lets us know that she's, she's finally like figured out. It's, it's locked in. She's, she has figured out what's going on with her two friends. I want this fight to be tough and I want it to be so emotionally charged and I just want this to be a real um, like kind of accumulation of all of the things that the three of them have been having to deal with for the past season and a half. That's why I want all three of them to be there because they've been the ones that have been dealing with so much the past like season and a half so I need all three of them to be there. <laughs> in the end Queen Bee is able to use Venom on Cat Blanc immobilizing him, which is, allows Ladybug to purify the Akuma. The first thing that Ladybug does after this is just she wraps Cat Noir up in a hug and Queen Bee joins soon after and the two girls tell him that they're always going to be there for him and that if he ever needs to talk to them, they're always going to listen. So in the next few episodes, we can see that it's official Ladybug and Cat Noir are not going for Rina and Carapace anymore. They are strictly going for Queen Bee. The new Akumatized villains are being boosted by the Peacock Miraculous, so they've really been needing that extra help. It, but it's not getting to the point where they, like, they need the whole team. Ladybug and Cat Noir have also been going to Master Foos more often, trying to get more information on the butterfly and peacock and how they can work together and they just they want some answers. Master Fu is being as frustratingly vague as ever and is only giving them like the bare bones of information. <laughs> so as a result of this, Lady Bung Ka Noir have kind of started to doubt his abilities and more specifically his rules and stuff. So after a fight where they needed Queen B, Ladybug gives Chloe a way to contact her through her yo-yo, not her phone, so we don't get like a kind of double phone numbers thing, um, so that they're able to like communicate better if she's needed for a fight. So despite everything, Marin and Adrian are still stressed beyond belief, and they start to kind of vent to each other as civilians and as their superhero selves. And as a result of this, the two of them start to notice some similarities between their civilian best friend and their superhero best friend, but they're dealing with so much right now that they don't even have time to like think about this and kind of start to connect the dots, even though they're starting to become rather clear. So Lila has seemed to firmly have wedged her way between Marinette and her old friends and has decided that it is finally time to make that final push to push Marinette out for good. She has a plan and ends up threatening Marinette in the school locker room, and this can be very reminiscent of, like, the bathroom scene. However, Lila is very unaware that Chloe is also there going through her locker on, like, the other side of where Lila and Marinette are. As soon as she heard Lila's voice, she was on high alert, and she like brings out her phone and starts recording. And Chloe manages to get the whole interaction on camera and it's really, really damning. In theory, Lila's plan would have worked, but she didn't count on the fact that there are still a couple people that are willing to stick up for Marinette. Chloe immediately comforts Marinette after Lila leaves, telling her that she knows how to finally make Lila stop, but she doesn't tell Marinette that she's got the video. That afternoon, during class, Chloe sends the video to everyone in class, and then the room just erupts in chaos. There's a lot of yelling and a lot of confusion, but one thing is clear. Lila is not a good person and has been lying about everything. Chloe's just kind of sitting in the back watching the whole thing unfold while Marinette and Adrian are like, um, what did you do? What is going on? And are just trying to get her to explain. Marinette is able to kind of figure it out a little bit and thanks Chloe immensely. <laughs> Eventually, Lila leaves and the rest of the class tries to like apologize to Marinette. She's probably too nice for her own good and there's a large part of her that's telling her to just like accept the apology. She ends up telling them that she understands that Lila was manipulative, but they really hurt her and it's gonna take a while for everything to go back to normal. And everyone seems to respect this, but you can see how hurt Nino and especially Alia are by this. And Adrian can tell how uncomfortable the whole situation has left Marinette, so he and Chloe are able to get permission to let the three of them leave class early, and they all go back to Chloe's to kind of get a break from it all. The end of the episode can be Lila trying to contact Monarch and work with him again, but he turns her down, saying that he already has a plan and that there's no need for her. 
And he also says that he doesn't work with failures. I just want to knock Lila down like one more peg. <laughs> All right. It's finale time, baby. Let's go. So I kind of want this to be sort of reminiscent of Hero's Day in a way. You'll see what I mean later. So it turns out that Monarch's plan that he spoke about in the previous episode was Optigami. It turns out that Optigami has been following the heroes around since the start of the season, managing to catch the identities of both Arena and per- Carapace, like the one time that they were needed. He hasn't been able to get the identities of the other three, but he feels like he's close to getting Queen Bee's identity, and that's all he would need to enact his plan. I think we it could be cool that we can see kind of like the black butterfly in the background of different episodes, just to kind of like reaffirm that like this is happening and kind of give like a hint that it's happening, and then like people can like go back and see it and be like, oh, look, it was there, it was there, okay? They're there, but we don't know about it until this moment. So he's going to send out another Akuma, and we are not going to see the fight from the hero's perspective. We're going to see it through Monarch's perspective, watching the fight through Optigami. And then the unfortunate is going to happen. Optigami catches Chloe giving back the Bee Miraculous to Ladybug, and that's it. Later on, Marinette's going to see a report that both Monarch and a blue-themed villain have been spotted. The heroes end up fighting him and they needed to get the whole team back together for this. Like, there's no way they could just do it with the three of them as much as Marinette didn't want to bring Rena and Carapace back. So before they fight, Monarch reveals that he knows the name of Rena Rouge, Carapace, and Queen B. And this is like a complete shock to everyone and the villains are able to catch them off guard for a moment, but it doesn't last long. I want this to be a really cool battle and I want some epic moments from like the other three heroes specifically. Mayura is going to be mostly using different Senta monsters to keep the heroes busy, but she's going to do some kind of like hand-to-hand combat fighting as well. And during the fight, I want Monarch to use some sort of like new ability. I don't really know what it would be, but it's the important thing is that he has somehow gotten some new power since they last fought him. In the end, Mayura is going to be captured by the heroes, maybe using Venom, and they're able to take her miraculous, revealing her to be none other than Natalie Sancor. Gabriel Agrest's assistant. I think I said her last name right. In the chaos of this reveal, Monarch is able to sneak away, nabbing the Peacock Miraculous before doing so. Cat Noir is like in complete shock because he trusted Natalie and she ends up getting arrested and taken away. And this whole fight has just kind of left the heroes feeling very conflicted because firstly, three out of five identities have now been revealed and they don't know how, which means it will no longer be safe for the three of them to be heroes anymore. Secondly, they defeated Mayura, which is a big blow to the villains and a huge step forward for the heroes. And finally, despite beating Mayura, Monarch still has the Peacock Miraculous, so they're just feeling a complete like whirlwind of emotions right now. All right, that's season three. That's season three. I really wanted this to be a low point for the heroes, and when I say low point, I mean it. This might be bad to say, but I really wanted them to, like, go through it this season just to make the ending feel more, like, triumphant and earned. And now let's talk about some of the details. So I had a hard time thinking that Lila would be able to turn the whole class against Marinette just with her lies. So I needed there to be some moment that Lila would be able to feed off of and Marinette unfortunately provides a lot of these instances with having to disappear. She is the savior of the city, so obviously that's going to come first, but that is going to mean that a lot of her friendships are going to be really strained. That's just an unfortunate consequent like side effect of this whole thing. However, I didn't want her to suffer like way too much and be like completely alone, so I wanted to make sure that both Adrian and Chloe were there for her as well because Adrian kind of understands what she's going through with the whole kind of keeping secrets thing. Like, he can tell that she's keeping a secret from everybody, but can't, and obviously can't tell people, and he knows what that's like. And Chloe obviously knows what she's going through with the whole Lila thing, because Chloe's also going through that. And while I was writing this, I realized just how much I liked the three of them as a trio together. I thought they'd be super fun and interesting, so that's why I kept including them more and more as I went on with this season. Now, I'm a fair person. If Marinette's gonna suffer, Adrian also has to suffer, right? And what better way to do that than through his father? 
I was really debating on if I wanted to include Cat Blanc or not in this rewrite because it was going to be so completely different than the original show, but I just really wanted to make sure I captured the same emotion as the original because I thought that was a really well done episode in terms of creating strong emotions for the audience, so I wanted to make sure that if I did Cat Blanc, I'd be able to do the same thing. And I think having the trio of Marinette, Adrian, and Chloe set up before this episode and having that be a strong point and then having that be a big moment in Cap, like the Cat Blanc episode would be kind of the most satisfying way I could really make it like emotional and powerful. <laughs> I also think that having Chloe starting to like figure some things out here and kind of this being like the moment where she figures it out is also really fun and kind of add some more layers to this whole episode. I just, I think this is a really important episode to include because it really shows how dangerous someone with a miraculous can be if they get akumatized, which I think is important to show. We needed to see what that was like because we hadn't really seen it before, so I thought that would be really interesting to show here. And what better way to do it than with Cat Blanc. As for Lila, she did need to succeed at some point. However, I felt like her time was kind of running out and I thought that with the final season, it would be better if the heroes were able to put their focus completely on Monarch rather than splitting it between the two. It would have been interesting, but in all honesty, I was kind of running out of ideas for Lila. And I thought it'd be better just to kind of wrap her up and finish it all before I just kind of, rather than like trying to draw it out, I just think it's better. And it just, I didn't want to run out of things to do with her like a certain show has. So I don't know if I've made this clear yet, but we as the audience don't know who Monarch is. I mean, it was obviously pretty obvious in the original, even before he was revealed, but I kind of like the idea of like trying to keep it a mystery. So Natalie being revealed as Myura should be a really big hint on who Monarch is, and it's going to bring up a lot of questions for the audience. Technically, they like in an ideal world, they wouldn't know who he is, but it's also going to bring up a lot of questions for the characters as well. So it is finally time. Let's get into the final season I have written, season four. So we're going to open on the heroes getting the miraculous back from their friends. And the whole mood is just kind of like really somber and just kind of like, this sucks. So Leva and Cat Noir end up going to Master Fu's, hoping that they can get some information out of him finally because whatever just happened happened and now Monarch has a new ability and they just want him to start telling them something. And then Master Fu's just like, you're not ready to be learning about this. You have so much more training left to do and you have to go through that before I can tell you about this. And this is the final straw for the two heroes. They have been consistently left in the dark when it comes to these things, and it's starting to cost them big in fights. They have reached a point where they have come to a mutual decision that they can no longer trust Master Fu, only when it's like absolutely, absolutely necessary. In the meantime, the akumatizations have stopped, and Marinette and Adrian are slowly returning to their normal lives. Stopped momentarily. Marinette is like working to try and rebuild some of her friendships with her classmates, and it's a slow process, but with Lila gone, it does seem possible. Marinette also gets a chance to apologize to Luca. She can't tell him why she did what she did, but she apologizes for being an awful girlfriend to him. Luca accepts her apology, but the two end up not getting back together. They do end up staying pretty close as like friends though, and you can tell how relieved Marinette is to be friends with Luca again. He was always really good for her outside of school and the whole, like, being there for her outside of school and outside of the whole superhero thing, and I think it's important for her to continue to have that because as great of a friend as Adrian and Chloe are, they're very, very connected to all of the stuff that's going on, even if Marinette's not, doesn't know about how connected they are completely. <laughs> well, things start to be, like, kind of looking up for Marinette. Adrian can't say the same. Ever since Natalie was arrested, Gabriel has been acting even worse than normal. He knows that the way his dad is treating him is like only a result of Natalie being arrested, but the longer it goes on, the more Adrian is starting to suspect that there is something more to this whole situation that his father is not telling him about. 
So, despite Gabriel being awful, there has been a momentary pause on Adrian's photo shoots, so he's gotten some more free time, meaning that he's spend, spending less and less time at home. And even after the whole Lila incident, Adrian, Chloe, and Marinette are still hanging out pretty consistently, like just the three of them. But they're like slowly starting to bring Alia and Nino into the group. But at its core, it's that trio. It will always be that trio. Unfortunately, the Akuma attacks had to come back at some point. Um, Sandboy is going to be the first one Akuma ties since this, and it's going to be a big one. Marinette's going to be awoken by the sound of someone on her balcony, and when she goes up to check, expecting it to be Cat Noir, she instead finds Cat Blanc. This immediately, like, immobilizes her because she never thought she'd see him again. And why, why, is, why is he here? Why is he at her house? Like, what's going on? On the other hand, Adrian is awoken by two voices outside of his room, and when he goes to check it out, he sees that his father is speaking to Monarch, and they look like they're planning something. Monarch then turns and catches him looking at them through the door, but Adrian slams it shut before anyone can get in. He transforms, leaving through his window, and is about to go back in through the front door when he looks out on the street and sees a bunch of people running around screaming. As much as it hurts him, he decides that it's more important to investigate this, and he will deal with whatever his father was doing later. Marinette is able to slip back inside her room without Cap Blanc noticing her, and she is just freaking out. <laughs> Tiki is able to calm her down enough to get her to transform, and she slips out one of the windows, swinging back onto the balcony to confront Cap Blanc. He's, like, immediately taunting her, telling her that she, this is what she was afraid of, right? That this would happen again, because now she's got nobody to help her. He tells her that she's all alone now, and it's not like she could really fight him anyways. They begin to fight, and Ladybug is able to lead him away from the bakery. She ends up losing him at some point, needing a moment to catch her breath. Just then, she spots Cat Noir helping civilians deal with whatever is going on on the streets. Relief immediately, like, floods over her, and she calls out to him, like, and, like, jumping on him and hugging him as soon as she sees him. She tells him that she saw Cat Blanc and thought that he'd gotten akumatized again, but he reassures her that that's, that's not happening. He then gives her the rundown of everything that he's seen, and from what he's gotten from other people, it seems as though everyone's nightmares have come to life. Just then, they spot Sandboy flying above them, and that becomes their new target. The fight happens, and Cat Blanc is there, and it's very weird for Cat Noir to be fighting against, like, his evil self. They end up beating him, though, and afterwards, Ladybug and Cat Noir head to the top of the Eiffel Tower to talk. Ladybug explains that the thought of Cat Blanc coming back has always terrified her, especially since their new allies are now unavailable because she doesn't know if she'd ever be able to fight him alone. It was so difficult the last time, and that was with the help of Queen Bee. She then asks Cat Noir what his nightmare was, and he tells her that he fears that his father is working with Monarch. And he just says, my father. He doesn't say Gabriel Agrest is working with Monarch. He's just like, I think my father is working with Monarch. Ladybug's immediately like, um, why do you, what's going on? Why do you think that? Like, do you know something? And Cat Noir just tells her that he can't tell her anymore because that, of like the whole secret identities thing. He does help tell her that he's going to look into it, and if he finds something out, he will tell her, and then they'll deal with it together, like they always do. This does seem to be enough for her because she trusts him, and the two of them just kind of sit on the top of the Eiffel Tower, looking down at the city below. Like, they just really needed a moment to kind of decompress after that whole thing. So after this, Adrian begins to spy on his father. It takes a while, but he soon figures out that his father is hiding something behind the portrait of his mother in his office. However, he isn't able to find the time to sneak into the office to see what's in there because it seems like his father is just, like, never leaving the office. After this, Adrian begins to confide in Marinette as both himself and as Cat Noir. During school, he just tells her that he's worried that his father is doing something that he won't be able to come back from. However, as Cat Noir, he ends up t spotting her on her balcony one night and she looks stressed, so he decides to, like, go and see what's going on. She tells him that there's someone close to her that was akumatized a while ago. She doesn't say who, but she keeps thinking about it. She says that the whole thing really scared her because it made her feel helpless, like she couldn't do anything to help him, and also because she didn't see how much he was struggling before, and that really hurt her as well, because she didn't want him to be going through something and not having anyone there to help him. She says that she should have seen that something was bothering him and helped him, but she didn't, and then he got akumatized. Cat Noir tells her that it absolutely isn't her fault and that she shouldn't be putting all this pressure on herself. 
some people are just really good at hiding their feelings, so she really shouldn't blame herself for not noticing. And as long as she's there for this friend now, that's all that's really important. She obviously can't tell Cat Noir that he's the friend that she's talking about, but it's nice to be able to kind of voice this just out loud. She ends up thanking him, telling him that, like, that really helped, and it's... She's glad that she can talk to somebody about this, just kind of in a different way than she could with as Ladybug. Marinette, in a similar way to their conversation from the first season, notices that something's bothering Cat Noir and asks him about it. He tells her that this probably, he probably shouldn't be telling her this, but she insists telling him that she's always willing to listen. He then tells her that he's worried that his father is connected to Monarch somehow. She then asks him why he thinks this, and he tells her that he can't really tell her, but there have been some recent circumstances that would suggest that. She tells him how terrible that is and asks if there's anyone he can talk to about this outside of her, and he just tells her that it's been really hard because there's only so much he can say without, like, revealing his identity to anyone, and it's been really tough to keep all of the details of this to himself. She then asks if he has, like, any concrete proof, and he says no, but he's working on it. Marinette tells him, like, hey... Please be careful, because if you're right about this, this could be really dangerous. And he tells her that he will be, don't worry, but it's good to know that someone's looking out for him. The whole thing is just really, I want it to be really sweet and wholesome and just a moment for these two to talk in a way that we really haven't seen since season one. I really wanted that to be a nice parallel back to their like kind of first real conversation that they had. I want to, I want to bring that back. So after all of this, Ladybug and Cat Noir seem to be working together better than ever. It's been a while since it's been the two of them, and it's amazing to see how quickly they've fallen back into their old patterns. In the end, it's always been the two of them against the world, and they are really proving that they are at their strongest when they're together. So there finally comes a day where Adrian is able to sneak into his father's office, and he ends up finding an old book behind the portrait of his mother. When he looks inside, he finds pages and pages of information about all of the different miraculous and their powers. In a split-second decision, Adrian ends up taking the book with him and brings it on patrol with him next time they have patrol. Ladybug is very intrigued by the book, pouring over the pages before, like, taking a moment and, like, stepping back and be like, um, where did you get this? And he confesses, I, I stole it from my dad. And she immediately was like, that's this is dangerous why did you take this um she then comes up with a plan all right saying like hey let's just take pictures of the pages and then you can put it back okay so we still have all the information but your dad will probably never realize that it was ever gone in the first place he agrees and the two of them spend the next couple patrols like pouring over like the book like the pictures of the pages of the book that they got learning more and more about the different miraculous and how one can unlock their new abilities i no idea what these abilities would be. Probably not what Ladybug gets in the show, but just know that they exist and they're helpful. <laughs> That's all you can really come up with now for this. So we're going to do a couple more villains after this, and during each one, Ladybug and Cat Noir can have a moment where they unlock their new ability and use that to help them win the fights. So Master Fu then learns of this and finds a way to confront the two heroes. He is very upset that they've gone behind his back to, like, learn about this and figure it all out and questions, like, wait, how did you even learn this in the first place? And then the two heroes go off on him. They tell him that they are done listening to him because he has done nothing for them and every battle that they've won recently has been all them and only them with zero help from anyone else else. They tell him that they are going to finish the fight against Ponok on their own with no help from him and that they are done playing by his rules. He then threatens to take away the miraculous because duh and they're like you won't. We're the best Ladybug and Cat Noir that you've had in a while and there's no way that you'd be able to find any other people to do what we do this late in the game. They also say that Tegan Plague would never agree to this because they don't want to have a new holder when the two of them are still out there. The pair then leave Master Fu's coursing on the adrenaline of finally confronting him. They go to their usual spot on top of the Eiffel Tower to celebrate, proud that they finally stood up to the person that's seemingly been holding them back for so long now. Once they've kind of calmed down a little bit, Cat Noir then asks Ladybug if she really meant what she said when she was like, we're done playing by your rules. She tells him like, yeah, of course I meant it. 
but then he asked if that means the identity one as well. I know that I had said that they have, like, a conversation where they, like, agree not to, like, reveal their identities, but I want that kind of idea to be, like, really enforced by Master Fu, like, have him really stress the importance, do not reveal your identities to each other. (laughs) So, even though they kind of, like, agreed to that in the beginning, it was something that was really pushed upon them by Master Fu throughout most of the show. Despite everything, Ladybug's still kind of hesitant about that. She tells him that she still isn't sure that it's like the smartest thing to do, especially with Monarch getting more and more intense every day. She tells him that there's a part of her that really wants to do it, but she's just really concerned about her family and what would possibly happen to them if Monarch ever got to either of them again. Cat Noir tells her that he completely understands and that he respects the decision. So the two of them hug and he tells her that he's always going to be there for her no matter what. The besties they are, we love them. She tells him that she knows that and that she'll always be there for him too. The conversation doesn't last too long before the two are back to talk about how cool it was that they finally stood up to Master Fu and they kind of go through all of the parts of the confrontation that they thought was like really cool. This talk is going to be very reminiscent of their other patrol conversation and it's just kind of going to serve as like a reminder that despite everything, these are still the Laban Cat Noir that we know and love. And now I think it's time for the series finale. Oh, I'm so excited for this. I'm so excited for this one, guys. <laughs> All right. So we see Monarch going through different pictures on a screen, looking at the three different miraculous holders that have been revealed so far. We see him make the connection that they're all in the same class, Adrian's class, and he concludes that there has to be some sort of connection between the class and whoever holds the ladybug and black cat miraculouses. After this, we see the entire class be invited to some party being hosted by Gabriel Agrest's company. Adrian is very suspicious of this, but goes along with it, promising to be on high alert the entire time. The class goes to the party and everything seems to be going well for a while. However, at some point, there is an Akuma alert, and Marinette and Adrian each find a way to sneak off and go and fight the villain. Throughout the entire fight, Leibug and Kanawar are getting, like, a really bad feeling about this, and that there's something else going on that they just can't seem to figure out. They beat the villain and are both very careful when heading back to the party, assuming that if something's happening, it's going down there. So both of them get back to the party. They don't know that the other is like going back to the party and Marinette is able to catch one of her classmates being grabbed by like what looked like a Santa monster. She goes to try and find a place to hide and transform, finding an elevator that's going to be perfect. Once she goes in, she's about to transform and then Adrian also runs in. He tells her that he saw someone get taken and he was just trying to find a place to hide. Convenient excuse. Marinette confirms that she also saw something like this and had like a similar thought that she was going to go and hide too. Sure, girl. The power then cuts out, trapping them inside the elevator. Marinette is desperately trying to find a way to get them out, but then Adrian tells her that he has a way and that she's going to have to trust him. She's confused, but then notices that he's kind of like messing with the ring on his finger, one that she'd never really like paid attention to before. She's about to say something when Adrian transforms into Cat Noir. He cataclysms the elevator door before picking her up and running through the halls. He tells her that he needs to get her out of there into a safe place, and Marinette's, like, trying to protest, but it's not working until they're able to get up onto, like, the roof of the building. And I'm thinking what kind of stops him here is that she kind of uses, like, whatever Ladybug's nickname for Cat Noir is. One that, like, only he would know. Then there's, like, a little moment where he's, like are you really? And she's like, yeah. And she transforms and this can be like at night. So like nobody like sees this happening and he like immediately hugs her, but they don't have time to talk because their friends have just been like kidnapped by a Santa monster. Monarch then sends out a message to Ladybug and Cat Noir telling them to meet him at a specific address, the aggressed mansion, if they want to get those they care about back. This then confirms his Adrian's, like, suspicion that his father is a monarch. We can see him kind of trying to toy back and forth with the idea that his father is working with monarch or his father is monarch. He's, like, trying to figure that out. But this, like, confirms it for him. However, he's not exactly sure what monarch's goal is. The two acknowledge that, yeah, this is definitely a trap, but they don't really have a choice and they just go to Adrian's house. Um, They get there and they don't 
see anybody. They, like, look everywhere and cannot find their friends. Ladybug questions if Monarch is even here, but Cat Noir tells her that he knows that he is. He has to be. They make it to Gabriel's office, and Cat thinks about how he found the grimoire behind the portrait of his mother. He manages to find the buttons on the painting, and that brings him and Ladybug down to Monarch's lair. Monarch is there, in the center of the room, waiting for them, but their friends are still nowhere to be seen. He tells them that his scent monster has them hidden somewhere, and that they're safe, for now, but they won't be if they don't cooperate. The heroes don't cooperate. Monarch tells him that he is just there to talk, and that he has something that he thinks Cat Noir would want to see. They follow him down to the sanctuary where Adrian's mother is being kept in her little, like, coma tube. He then asks Adrian to join him and to help him in bringing his mother back. He tells him that they can finally be a real family again, and that all he needs is for him to give him his ring and Ladybug's earrings. I don't think I have it written down here, but once Adrian and Marinette left to go and fight the villain, this is where Gabriel is able to figure out that they are Cat Noir and Ladybug because they're the only people not present at the party anymore. <laughs> okay, that wasn't clear. I probably should have stressed it before, but now I know. It takes him a moment, but Adrian then tells Gabriel that there is no way that he would ever do that and that they would never be a real family. He tells him that a real father would have never abandoned his son like Gabriel did and that he would never be able to forgive him for the terrible things that he has done both as Gabriel and more specifically as Monarch. Cat Noir makes a lunge for the Peacock Miraculous here, catching Monarch off guard. He grabs it, tossing it to Ladybug, who is able to quickly store it in her yo-yo, completely hidden from Monarch. And now this ensures that their friends are completely safe and they can actually fight Monarch now. So again, not writing the fight scene out, but I want it to be in the sanctuary because I think that'd be such a cool place for a fight to take place. But the whole fight is super tough and they're all like really battered and bruised by the end of it. But Cat Noir and Ladybug finally win. They take the butterfly miraculous, finally confirming 100% that Gabriel is monarch. Even though we knew it, everyone knew it, but they just needed to like see it happen and be like, yes, this man is the villain. <laughs> they end up waiting for the police to show up, getting the location of their friends out of Gabriel before they set him off, finding their friends afterwards and setting them free. In the following days, Adrian is able to stay with Chloe since there really isn't anyone left that he can stay with. And Adrian, as Cat Noir, ends up visiting Marinette a lot, where the two of them are just spending hours and hours talking, finally being able to talk about things that they hadn't been able to in the past. They end up getting called back to Master Foos, and he tells them that despite how angry their last conversation left him, it made him think that maybe he was wrong about the way that he was being a guardian. He then tells Marinette that he thinks that there would be nobody better to guard the Miracle Box, and that the new guardian should be her. She accepts, and he tells her that it is up to her now how she serves as guardian, but he'll always be there to give advice if she needs it. I'm not doing the memory wipe thing. <laughs> One night, they're up on Marinette's balcony, just the two of them, and Adrian finally gets the courage to kiss her. It's super sweet, and Marinette, like, immediately melts into it. They can say something super sweet and cheesy at the end, and that will be the end of the show. Maybe, like, in the final credits, we can do, like, this little scene. We see a glimpse of their friends' reactions to everything and how life is going to be like for them moving forward. Maybe we can see Alia, Nino, and Chloe getting their miraculous back full time. Their identities, identities were only revealed during the fight. Nobody else really got that. And we do. I want to have a scene where Chloe reveals that she's known who they are and who they have been for like a long time. And that if everyone just opened their eyes, they would have figured it out too. I just want the ending to feel very kind of lighthearted and to really feel like, yes. They did it. They finally won. So there is season four for you guys. I figured it was about time to like change up the way that Ladybug and Cat Noir interacted with Master Fu. He's always kind of frustrated me as a character and so I wanted to change the way like his role in the serve in the story and like the purpose that he served and I just wanted to provide some new dynamics for the heroes. I figured changing him was a good way to do that. I also wanted this to be more of an Adrian-centered season since the last season was kind of more focused on Marinette. And with his dad being Monarch, I just thought that this would be the best time to do a more Adrian-focused season. I know that the original show isn't done yet, but I really want to see some sort of struggle 
between like within Adrian and Cat Noir surrounding his father and his possible involvement with Monarch. And I wanted to have it be like have a good moment where he kind of figures out that there might be some sort of involvement and I figure Natalie being revealed as Mayura would be the best way to do that. Also, I am such a sucker for the idea of Marinette and Cat Noir like talking like at night on her balcony. So I really wanted to make sure I included that again. I thought this would be a really good way to ensure that the audience is able to see the two characters falling for both halves of each other because that's one of the biggest problems that I had with the show up until season five is that it always just felt like they were only in love with one half of each character and not the other half. So I wanted to make sure that we saw that they love them as a whole because Marinette is also Ladybug. They are one whole person. They fit together to make a whole person. Same with Adrian and Cat Noir, and we hadn't really seen them being in love with the other half of each person, so I wanted to make sure that we got some good scenes where there's at least a genuine friendship build up between them, so it would make sense when they eventually got together, because up until season five, there was not a genuine friendship between Marinette and Adrian at all, so it would have felt very weird if they just kind of got together when there wasn't any sort of friendship built up between them. Obviously, season five has like changed that drastically, um, which was a shock to me when I watched it. But when I wrote the script, that hadn't happened yet at all. So I wasn't expecting that to happen. So, so I wanted to make sure I included it here. I knew that it would be kind of an interesting decision to not reveal Monarch's identity to the audience. I mean, obviously, I'm rewriting a show, we know that Gabriel's Monarch, but in the bigger picture, we wouldn't know who he was, and I think that provides more of kind of a mystery surrounding him, and kind of makes him more, like, threatening as a result, and I like the idea of having this, like, suspense to any scene between Gabriel and Adrian, when we're, like, suspecting that Gabriel's Monarch, but we don't know, and it really raises the tension of those scenes, like, way more than we're currently getting. Now, the reveal. I had two different places that I was thinking about putting the reveal, and the one that I ended up going with was my first thought originally. I think this is just more of a solid option, and it really heightens the stakes for everything, especially going into the final battle, and it really makes for an epic finale. The other place I was considering doing it was after they have their confrontation with Master Fu and they're like talking on the Eiffel Tower. I thought that rather than Ladybug shutting down Cat Noir's idea, she agrees to it and they reveal their identities there. I like wrote this whole scene out because I was like really trying, like going back and forth between this. Um, and so I ended up going with the option where they reveal it later on because I think that just worked better. However, I ended up writing this out and it feels like a shame for it to go to waste and there's like a couple things that would have needed to happen like I don't think Ladybug and Cat Noir would have had the conversation in the first season about not revealing their identities and I think Ladybug would have had to have been more hesitant with Master Fu's rules than we ended up seeing so I think that those are a couple things that would have needed to happen if we went with this alternative version but I wrote it out and I'm gonna I'm gonna share it with you guys because I think that'd be fun <laughs> so Cat Noir asks if not playing by his rules also includes the identities rule. And Ladybug's a little hesitant because she's the one that's always been adamant on sticking to this rule. She then asks him if he thinks that they're finally going to end this fight. And Cat Noir is like, yeah, I, I think we're finally going to do it. She says that, yeah, you know what? We should do it. We should reveal our identities because this might be really useful. And if she's being honest, she's always been like really, really curious. <laughs> Cat Noir goes first, and Ladybug is shocked, a little confused, but mostly just, like, really excited. And this will make sense because we had seen that friendship built up between Marinette and Adrian. Ladybug then goes next, and it takes less than a second for Adrian to, like, absolutely crush her in a hug. He's just so happy that two of his best friends are, have been the same person all along, and that he was there to help her and be there for her when she was struggling. And everything's just super sweet and happy, and it's such a light moment in the like such a dark season and Adrian's the one that kind of addresses the elephant in the room like with the whole like being in love with each other kind of thing but Marinette tells him like as much as I want to I think it's best if we wait and we try and figure this whole monarch thing out first and he agrees and they hug again and it's just such like a sweet 
moment and it really solidifies this kind of like victory for them and finally confronting Master Fu and kind of ridding themselves of his rules and stuff and like fully stepping out and being their own heroes. Now, like I said, some things would need to have happened previously for this to make sense, such as them kind of having a plan in place to make sure that they're making rational decisions if Monarch ever does capture one of them, or having like a more kind of in-depth conversation about like the good and the bad of revealing their identities. Like, I don't know if we would have needed to see this, but I feel like this should have happened if the second sort of reveal is how we went with it. And you know, I've just always loved the idea of the two of them revealing their identities to each other in a stressful situation, specifically out of the need to protect one another. I think that's just the best and I really wanted to make- that's why I ended up going with the first option and putting the reveal where I did because it's just like one of my favorite ways that a reveal could go down. Finally, as cool as the team of heroes was, I really wanted the final fight to just be between Ladybug and Cat Noir versus Monarch. It's always been them and I wanted to bring that back in the final fight. Anyways, I hope you guys really enjoyed that. This was a lot of work. I These rewrites do take me a really long time, but the end result is always really rewarding for me and I'm really happy with the finished product. As much as it kills me to spend this long on something and with how difficult it can be to rewrite a show, I still love doing this. I think it's really fun and I'm always super pleased with the results. I do think it'd be fun if I did a video where I kind of like broke down the process that I do for going about this. And if that's something that you guys are interested in, please let me know. I'm probably still going to do it anyway, but I'd like to know if there's actually any interest in doing this. So yeah. Um, again, I really do hope you guys enjoyed this because um, it was so much work. If you like this sort of content, I do have another rewrite for Voltron Legendary Defender. I did that a couple of years ago. Um, I will put that up in the little card, whatever side it's on. You guys can watch that if you would like. Um, and I have another Miraculous video that I just put out. You can put that up there too if you guys want to watch that. And yeah, make sure to subscribe if you liked this. Give it a thumbs up. Comment, tell me what your favorite part of this rewrite was. I want to know. I love hearing your guys' opinions on these. And if there's anything that you would do differently, please let me know. I'm really curious. And yeah, that's going to be it. And I'll see you guys in the next one.